It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Dr. Jacques Broch. We are here in your beautiful apartment in Italia in Israel. And Jacques, you came from Vienna and you were one of the last trains to leave Vienna yeah. before the, the, the Second World War. Yeah, we actually left, I was born in Vienna, yes. And we actually left Vienna on the last train, the very last train to leave Vienna. On the 30th of August or something like that. In 1939. We, we arrived in England the day before, before the war broke out. We left it a bit late. <laughs> and when were you born? Well, I was born in 1931. Fourth of July, American Independence Day. <laughs> And, and, you, and your your parents and grandparents, where did they come from? Yeah, my parents, my, parents, my father was born in Vienna. Uh, I think my grandfather was also born in Vienna. My mother came from, she was born in um, Bratislava. And they, they, came, they came to Vienna, I don't know how they came to Vienna, but they came. And um, my... <coughs> So, I'll tell you a little bit about my father, because there's a lot of this. My father was born in Vienna. His father had been an officer, well, not actually an officer, a senior sergeant major, because at the time when my grandfather, I never met him, was in the army, the Jews were only allowed to, up to that, up to that uh, height in. No, no officer at that time. That, that was the highest that any Jew could have taken. And in fact, <coughs> we've got a, I have a beautiful discharge, I think my daughter, the beautiful dis discharge certificate on material. It's about that size, telling exactly in Hungarian and in German. It's, and it's a lovely material that, that was weighing about 1901, 1902. My father was born in. 18, well that's a long time ago, isn't it? 1897. And he's brought up in Vienna. He went to school there. He was about to, <coughs> he was about to enter university to do medicine when the, what's his name, was assassinated, which set off the First World War. Franz, Franz Joseph. And it was came to uh, 1916. My father was with another 17. Oh, that he was 17, all ready to enter school, but being lost at that time, he decided he wanted to go to join the army. So he went along, gave him a long date of birth, told him he was a year older than he was. Forgot about the medical students and joined the army. He became a lieutenant colonel. And he was taken prisoner, as it was one big bottle of taken prisoner, and he was sent to Irkutsk prison's war camp, which I don't know if you know, it's in the middle, punked in the middle of Siberia. I once read a book about that, uh, about Irkutsk, and somebody who escaped from Irkutsk and walked all the way to India. It's up in the middle. And um, he was there in that camp, he had a friend. He actually made um, a, a very keen chess player. He made a chess set out of stale bread. <laughs> and then the, the revolution came, which was revolution. He saw it. He was in the camp. Being, uh, being an officer, they had more privileges than he was allowed to leave the camp. He watched it. He watched what happened there. And he and his friend decided that they'd go off and leave the camp. There was a bit of chaos there at the time, so it was easy to well, the two of them went off, and um, they they had to get to they had to get to Moscow. Now the only way you could travel this way it was a long way. You had to get you know this is quite music bits too. You had to if you could you had to get paper. Well, there were all a lot of peasants now who were in charge, who were very illiterate. So they befriended the two of them befriended the station master's daughter. She came very friendly and she gave a piece of paper that a stamp, official stamp put in. And that took them to, to Moscow, because nobody could even show the paper that's official. He watched them, 
he watched, they saw the massacre, well, I've forgotten the date, 17, what did it, I think it was a September massacre, wasn't it? He and his friend from an attic in a room, they looked straight down on top of it. And they saw it. And he said then that he would join the Reds. He, he became an instructor in the Red Army's Cavalry Officers Cavalry Training Institute in Kashten, Tashkent. In fact, the Marcus always got hit by a horse. I didn't know how to learn to ride a horse, but, and he became an officer. Anyway, a few years later, he, he, after that, he decided it was time to come home. And uh, I think the Austrian ambassador was visiting Moscow, so they made their way there, and they decided to come home. Met my mother and got married, and um, that, that's going to be very relevant, actually. Now, let's go back to my life. The big event, of course, when, when Hitler annexed Austria. I see I can't find my father got a photograph of him marching through the street. Marching through the street. And that's when all the, well, don't know, everything started then in Vienna. They were very anti-Semitic. Well, there was such a lot of Jewish people in Vienna. See, there were about 200,000 living that lived in Vienna at that time. And, um, my father had a trade. He would. Um, they had a way of the shop selling perfumery. My father could actually. Um, yeah, he had a book about how to per make perfumes, different perfumes, and he was very good at it. He also had a, he also had a job selling perfume for another firm. And when all the trouble started, to just jump a little, um, I found a certificate and a letter the other day. When he, when he entered from San he could give him for his employers that he was a very good employer, there was nothing to complain about. And they were not Jewish, but he said, you know, he's one of the best employers. And it's a very nice letter. And funny enough, I only came across it the other day. And a few recommendations like that. Uh, okay, well, you know what happened. I was, now let's go to the Crystal Nacht. We were sitting in our apartment. We knew you couldn't leave the apartment. We knew that things were going, something was going wrong. And uh, eventually, they expected, knock on the door came, the banging on the door came. I was sent to the, in the other room, I left the door open, and six, um, Gestapo, not Gestapo, the SS, S, SA um, stood, stood there, so they it is, and it is, it didn't, they just walked in and they looked around and um, okay we'll take the that which happened in my father's prized possession his radio he always valued radios because in those days the communication over the world wasn't easy and he could he loved to be able to turn the knob and get in touch with all over the world he always did it and yes so they took that didn't take I don't think they took looked everywhere, didn't take anything else except they took my father. That was a night that in in Austria and in Vienna they arrested they already had a list of all the Jewish people where they lived. They arrested one Jewish person from every family. And a lot of them were sent to Dachau. We don't know where they took him. He was taken away. We tried to make inquiries, and said it might be the school. We eventually found out that it was the school which was used to keep people not far away from us. And I think my mother went there and she I'm not so sure now whether she saw from the window. And he was kept there. They took my auntie as well, but she being a very attractive young lady, she talked her way out of being kept by them. My own two uncles, two uncles who had heard about this, so they went into hiding before they came. He was he was there for about three weeks. I think it was about ten days or two weeks before we found out where he was. And he was released on certain conditions. Um, we had him. It's a big story. He, we had visas to go to China. 
a lot of Jewish people went to China. It's very interesting, Jewish community is still a center there, showed you where the Jewish people lived even to this day. We had visas to go, but we, and he, they just shall let him come out on the condition that he left the country within three months. So, comes in, ready to go. What happens? Russia stopped giving transit visas, closed its door to transit visas. You couldn't get to China any other way than that. Impossible. So I remember him going to, to Berlin to see if, what he could do. That was a long trip from Vienna in those days. By the way, <coughs> when he came out of the, the place where they kept him, he said the conditions were terrible. They were treated terrible, even in those days. People would come from tripping off the fourth floor committing suicide. They had to stand out, and it was in November, it was icy cold, to stand all night one night in, outside in the prison. It, it, it said it was terrible. It, it, that's just one or two of the things that I, was, I remember as children. Anyway, and then of course, then there came what they called the Fuji Plan, where this uh, Japanese ambassador in Russia, in Latvia, I think, within, in, in Latvia, started issuing transit visas. He was given it. And it's actually his birth in the, the forest of the Reichshof thing. He gave, gave about 2,000 visas to the Jews. Sugihara, the Japanese yeah. country. There's a book about it. Yeah. This. And uh, anyway, so we started looking elsewhere. I, I already had family in Israel. We had family in England. And we're looking. And, but to go to any of these places, you had to have a work permit. I had family in China who'd been and they who they actually they had actually got us the the work permit. They'd not been there about a year, but they managed to get the work permit which they couldn't use. So I had family in in Israel who who'd been here since nineteen thirty six. Because the man actually from that from very famous he became a, a major general here, Kalman again, played a big part in this in the Suez not in the Suez war in them. Yom Kippur War, uh, charge of the um, commander of the armoured forces in Sinai, and that was, and anyway, so we started looking elsewhere. Can I just ask you, Jack, before, can you show the picture of your family? Yeah. This was, this was taken just before we went to Vienna. This is before you left Vienna? Yeah. Those are my parents, myself, and two sisters. And how old were your sisters? I'm going to tell you. I one was six years older than me, one was nine years older than me. And this is the, the Brock family. And if you could just tell us a little bit, were you, were you in a... Um, were you in a? Um, were you brought up in a religious home? In no, no, no. My, my, my mother was more religious than my father. He, at that time, he'd been a communist, been all around the world. My mother came from Bratislava, and that family was more, in, more religious than anything. Did you go to a, a Jewish uh, primary school growing up in Vienna? Uh, Sorry? Did you go to a Jewish primary school? The school you went, went to, was it a Jewish school? I went to, yes, I went, I went to a Jewish club. Of, uh, I, I remember it around, around the corner from when I left. I can't remember the name of it. It was a Jewish, for, for young children. Went there. And were you in the Jewish in district? Fact, in fact, the night after the um, Kristallnacht, we went, uh, I think it must have been Tuesday, it was, we used to go to that night, so we went, we went to walk past the show, which had burned, all the books were still burning outside it. So could you tell us a some little bit the, about... Some, actually, I've got a, a photograph of all this, of my class, of my group and from that place. So yeah. Jacques, so could, that, you, could you tell us a little bit, of, a bit more about the Kristallnacht? What do you remember? I, can, I wasn't allowed to look out. I mean, I could see, on the next day, I could see people scrubbing the street and you know, so. They made the, the Jews grab the street. Grab the Jews, people standing on the street, and we could see it just below our window. 
and in the street there wasn't very really nice. And did you feel the anti-Semitism? Could you feel that there was a tr tremendous anti-Semitism? Yes, yes. When you walked in the streets, could you feel it? I watched it. I wasn't allowed to go. My mother could actually go out because she, she was blown fairish. And she so she would she could walk through the streets and so was one of my sisters. <coughs> now let me before I lose my sister again. There you go. <coughs> so eventually my parents this is also very interesting, my parents got a visa, works visa for England. But once you have your visa, you you can go. And what, I mean, they got, yes, they got a belt. And the passport, it says, without Jack. Then my sisters had already were older than me, they had their own passport. And they particularly said, without Jack. And we were waiting, so we were waiting for my sisters. And the queues outside the British Embassy, as the American Embassy, I mean, they went down, you had to queue for days, not hours, like, like here. <laughs> You had to queue for, you had to queue for days. And um, so somebody said to my parents this afternoon, why don't you, why don't you, to my mother, why don't you write to the Queen of England? You tell her you've got two daughters, she's got two daughters. Tell her what's happening. Within one week, my sisters were called for the medical. And they got to the embassy, they went there. Yes, how do you, who do you know? What what protects you have you got? How's that come you how you because people are wait queuing for months? And you say to say to us we never got an answer to the letter, not a written reply. But it just shows it's very interesting. So once you've had your interview, uh, once you they had your, your medical then your visa followed automatically within a week, 10 days per week. You know, so. so my parents decided things were getting made bad. My sisters were older, they had their own passports already. They were older than me. That um, we would go ahead and they would follow a few days later. Well, as I told you, ours was the last train to leave. They, were, they survived. They did survive. But um, anyway, and uh, that's how, that's how I left with my pay. They took me and um, we, had a, 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 we had an aunt and a grandmother still lived in Vienna and another cousin. So, they, I mean, they weren't on their own. There was, there was quite a family there. And um, we went and we got to the border between Germany and Holland at Cologne. I can remember this vividly. I was 18 years old. I was sitting in the corner and they stopped everybody. In fact, we had a book about this reason, how they came out. Uh, the old master brought and inspected everybody's passport. One person, very, very efficient. They were very efficient in all that. They came in, took my father, took my father's passport and said, who's he? My father said, that's my son. He says, I've got that passport here. He said, it says in here, without Jack. You can't take him. He said, well, I can't leave him. He's my son, he's only a little boy. He said, no, you can't. What will happen if you get to England and don't let you in? I can remember this, this is actually... He says, I won't have to see about that. He said, no, you can't. I'll have to go and see my office that. Goes off, comes back, Falcon marches into the carriage there. Heil Hitler. What's going on, you know, what's happening? He's looking. Ask him again, who's he? He says on here without Jack, and he's looking, he's looking at the passport. And look, he says to my father, I see that you were an officer in the Austrian army in the First World War. So my father says, that's correct. He said, well, I am also an officer. As one off in the army, and as one officer to the other, I wish you good luck. Yeah. Now it shows, uh, <laughs> And it was almost a share that he didn't do his medical student and he joined the army. That was uh, as one officer, another officer, I wish you good luck, hi Hitler, and even so. Why did they put in the passport without Jack? 
Why did they do this? Because my, my, son, my parents had, a, had, a visa, had their works permit. My parents had their works permit, that's all. I mean, we were all graduates. I remember we had to report to the staff at one, at one time, including myself. We had to go to the office and uh, we had to sign things because they, they, they added a name to all the, all the women, Jewish women, who had it. Sarah was actually an ache. And what, what did that do? I don't think that did actually make a lot of it. Yaakov, I don't know. The Israel, it was Israel, yeah. the added Israel. Yeah. And I had to sign something there, I was seven years old, seven, eight years. And I always got, used to write with my tongue out. And the thing was terrifying, so this officer said to me, if you don't put your tongue in, I'll cut it off. But the way things were, you know, I thought it meant it. I was like, oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> and one day my father had to report, and another person there, exactly the same name, Paul Broch, born the same date. And they didn't want my father to do it for them. That was, that was a coincidence. Anyway, so we arrived in England. And can I ask, when you left, and you had to leave your, your sisters behind, it must have been a bit well, of a trauma. No, we, we, they were supposed to follow within a few days. They'd already had the medical. Once they had the medical at the embassy, your visa follows, uh, comes automatically within a week. Oh, so you, th you thought they were going to follow you soon? Yes, it was ready, everything was ready for them. And to what happened when you found, your parents found out that there were that no, no more trains? Sorry? When they found out that, these, that yours was the last train, they must have been devastated. But if we didn't find out until we got to England a few days later, there was no more trains. Your, your parents must have been besides themselves, they must have been devastated. Yeah, well, yes, we did, you know, that nobody imagined what would happen after that. I mean, you couldn't imagine at the time. And the same, my grandmother, my grandmother was still there, my cousins were there. We had, we had one auntie who for, fortunately, I'd say, I must, had married out, so she had more freedom. She, she, she survived all together, living there with the husband. So, so they were not left exactly on their own. And what happened to your sisters? So, uh, well, I, I must say, I don't know very much. I mean, they survived, and one of them. Uh, somebody from the camps, and they were they emigrated to, to um, Canada, and the other one, met somebody who was found in Vienna afterwards. And um, one actually worked. The other one worked. The the younger one, the fair the one was more fair. She she could work. She looked didn't look at all. <coughs> yeah, she didn't. She could go out. She didn't look at all, particularly on. Uh, she could go out. She was dark and she's more like more Jewish, you see. So, the, and uh, she worked for a Jewish dentist, the older one, till I think, from what I hear, till 1941, 42, and then he disappeared. And that was that was the end of her job. They were hid away. They were, they were arrested one time and spent three months in were the prisons there before being released and that's all. By the way, I must tell you, when the Gestapo came to the Christian, I only heard this, being a little boy they didn't tell me I was eavesdropping. And the fellow that that was their leader happened to be our next door neighbour. And I heard him say, it would have been a lot worse for you if I hadn't come, if it hadn't been me. Who knows? He says, he just says, it was a friend, our friend, it would have been a lot worse for you if it hadn't, if it hadn't been me. So that's it. So who, can, who knows? Who knows what's good and bad? So from Cologne, do you remember what happened from Cologne when you got to the border with Cologne? Uh, with that officer. But w now you, are, you were going to England. Do you remember? We were going all the way to England from from um, Rotterdam, from the Hook of Holland, anyway, to Harwich, 
And I was just reading in a paper last week that at Harwich, where this boat used to land, the, the Kidna transport landed there as well. It must have been about the same day, something like that. And uh, they're going to put a monument at Harwich of the port where they all landed. I just read in the paper the other day, last week, in England. You're always putting up monuments somewhere. <laughs> and you remember the trip going on the, the ship, you remember? I was excited on the boat. <laughs> I was looking at Stanley, I was looking for England to we saw it. I mean, I was very excited about it. And anyway, when I came to England, my parents, we went to a place, assembly place in London, where the, uh, Blooms, I think it was Bloomsbury House. Um, all the uh, Jewish arrivals came there, got processed about saying, <coughs> they sent us up to, to Leeds. Well, I already had an uncle that lived there, one of the two that uh, got out, out without being arrested, and my grandmother. And my parents had to go and work in a, in a very fine big mansion in uh, just outside York, about 20 miles from Leeds. And I, had to, I went to live in a hostel um, in Leeds. It's quite a well-known hostel, they call it. The hostel. I don't know how many of them. I was one of the youngest. I was the second youngest there. I don't know how many people there were there, and um, my parents had very, very nice employers where they worked. My father was a general maintenance man, whatever you call it. My mother was a housekeeper and a cook. She was a very good cook. She made them chicken soup on a Friday night. The first night she was there, I said, "What's this?" Said, In England. They only ate chicken soup when somebody was ill. Uh-huh. That was the thing. And they said, nobody's in here. But they got vague. They got really used to having chicken soup fried that after that. And uh, strange enough, actually, their, their business, their big business, shops all over Yorkshire, all the big towns, they have to have been the biggest pork butchers in Yorkshire. But. Sometimes people that uh, people are not they were treated very nicely. So much so that this family came to see them every Christmas just before Christmas and brought them some Christmas presents. Not a lot of pork, but isn't it? Chocolates or whatever it was. Every year for years after. And so I once wrote a letter into the Jewish the uh, Associated Jewish Refugees magazine. Because somebody was complaining that they, they were very, very badly treated by the people who took advantage of them. So they were not, I'm sorry, they not but like that. My parents are very interested, in they, they really respected them. And as I say, they liked them so much every year, if not, probably twice a year, they came to see how they were getting on. It was very nice of them. It was a nice place. I remember I went out for once or twice for a ship out for a weekend. And it was a big estate that they had there. And uh, that's it, I lived in this hostel, I remember the hostel, the worst day in my day, it was one of the worst days in, that I had was when my father came along while I was still in the hostel with a policeman to say he had to go away because the Jewish people, the, the, the Brits were interning all enemy aliens. Jewish or Nazi, they didn't differentiate them. And as far as you came from Vienna or Germany, you were an enemy alien. They didn't take my mother, actually, they took my father. And he had to go to the Isle of, he was interned to the Isle of Baden. I don't know if you know, but that's something that. And um, he, he seemed to have this, this survival instinct in him. <laughs> because he told us they were all lined up, and somebody said, Can everybody here cook? So my father said, said well, if, I could, if I'm a cook, I won't starve. <laughs> because, yes, I'm a cook. And he became the cook, the cook there. That thing. And um, he was there for about six months, I think. Anyway, I mean, we could correspond then. But there was a lot of trouble between the Nazis, enemy agents, and the Jewish enemy, which I didn't realize until a long time later. That there was a lot of tri- trouble between them and the, and the other camps as well. They didn't differentiate between either. So, 
till until later on. And then my father come home, came home and I had to go and work in a munitions factory. You could have, and someone enjoyed the, uh, the army there, and so went to do commissions working. And that was basically what happened. Can I ask, were your parents in touch with your sisters? Was there any communication with your parents and your sisters that were still in Vienna? They were in Red Cross letters during the, the early part of the war. They were warned, you've got to stop this, because they found out that the Nazis were using this to put pressure on people, threatening them, like in England, to do espionage. So said, if you don't, we'll, your, your family will, will suffer there. So we have to stop the correspondence then. That was it. And so I asked, when did you... When and then after, we didn't pick up again until after the war. When did you see your sisters again? When did you see your sisters again? After the war. Did they come and visit you? They, no, my father and his brother went over there first. They went to the Stroud State after the war to see, to see them. And um, there were some nasty stories as well about the Jewish people going home and finding people living in their apartment. One fellow took the Nazis threw him out of the window. Really? Well, you know, after what they'd gone through and everything, yeah. Um, and when they, went, they, didn't, they were very unhappy when they, when they came back. In fact, I think they left a few days early. They'd seen their children, they could see what was going on, and they could see what plans they could make. And, um, and then I think they'd already get, they were already getting married. So this, this, they, were, they were already in their 20s. So they stayed there with their, with their husbands until one, till one went to Canada. Um, and when did you get to see, and your mother, when did your mother and you see your sisters? I thought, when did we, we get to see them? They came, they, they came to visit us once or twice, and they turned you from, from Canada as well. Did you have a closeness, or did the war... Um, yes, I'm still in touch with my kids with my niece and nephews. But with your sisters, did you still have so a closeness? The children or? from my, my sister's children. But your sisters, your sisters, sisters your, then she, she, they died, they, they both died. But did you have a closeness growing up or? Did with, I have cousins? Did you, were you close with your sisters? Did you feel a closeness, a bond? Yeah. One, one friend from my family left in 1936. The mother cousins, Left in thirty-eight. I remember one day they were. The, I was the youngest in the family. <laughs> the, the, the youngest. It's quite a big family. Um, left in nineteen thirty-eight. I do remember when you see what's going on with the with the Palestinians. I do remember go, go, coming home from a, for, or going to visit my cousin and see there's something going on. And then they were, were all staying stones at the Nazis. So I joined in, and I started throwing, throwing stones at them. The Hitler used a whole group of them, and then they turned and started chain and we ran like mad. I didn't know what was going on. I threw my stones, a couple of stones, my cousin said, come on. And then we oh, ran, no, no. we had to go like that because they came out chasing us. So that's where I learned to go. I became quite a good sportsman after that. <laughs> so. And Joyce, when you were growing up, did you experience a lot of anti-Semitism when you were walking on the streets in Vienna? Yes, wait a minute, I, I must say, all the Jewish children had to go, had to leave the school where I was, there was this, one school was dedicated and you, all the Jewish children had to go there. The place called the Kastelskasse. I went and visited it. Uh, twice I should have been there to Vienna and I visited it. And um, so I had to change. That had changed everything around this, this Jewish school. I was quite happy at the Jewish school, as far as I can remember. In fact, I met a, a lady here, she's died unfortunately, who was at the same school, my age, I met in England already, and um, she left three weeks before me. But she had a very good memory. She could remember the names of every teacher. I've got some photographs, but... Uh, 
I think there's not a lot of the school known as that. And she remembered the name of every teacher that I can... But I've got all my school reports. And um, I met her here. And I knew her very well, but I didn't know this until years later. We were talking. Which school did you go? Where did you go to? Well, I was there at the same time. And Jock, what happened to your grandmother that was left in Vienna? In? Your grandmother that was left in Vienna, what happened to her? Yes. Your grandmother in Vienna, what happened to her? I got Your grandmother? Oh, my grandmother. No, she said it and she died. And uh, one of my mother's sisters who was not married, and I don't see, unfortunately, she died in Auschwitz. She died in Auschwitz? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, in the type of circumstances we've been traveling out there, we, we got that from the very specific documents that the Nazis used to keep. I think my grandmother died of Nazi starvation or whatever it was. She was also sent? She was sent to yeah, the camp? Yeah, we camps. actually found the grave when, the, when we went over. I took my children over to visit and we looked, we found the grave of my grandmother there. Near there. And the grave of my grandfather as well. This happened. But I never knew him. I never knew either my grandparents, my grandfathers, I knew both my grandmothers. What, what else can I just tell you? So, so Jacques, can I just ask you, it's a, a difficult question, but w after the war, when you met your sisters again, your, your two sisters, yeah. after the war, did you feel a bond because you'd oh, been yes. separated? Oh, yeah. You did. Yeah. And your mother, she reconnected with her daughters? No, I mean, your mother was close to her, her daughters? Yes. We never lost the bond. I mean, you, 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 can, you can't forget your sisters. Yeah. I mean, you never did. But you, you, you were we close. They were visiting each other. They came to England. Mm -hmm. They went there. Especially my father and my parents. They went to visit them in Canada a few times. Quite regularly. And in, in Vienna, I don't think they were happy about going to Vienna about it. But um, so that's, what it, that's the way it was. And, and how did you feel when you, when, when you personally went back to Vienna? Was it very difficult to go back? The first time I went, I didn't go. <laughs> Interesting. We decided to go on a, on a day trip from England. The first day trips to different places in, little in the world. And they were very good. <coughs> we only lived a quarter of an hour away from the airport in Leeds, we were living. And there was a day trip from Leeds to Vienna. You know, I think I left her early in the morning and came back and we had a whole day in Vienna. I said, so why do we go? So one of my, my daughters that lived in Manchester, and the other two were living here already. That can come with you. I said, of course you can't. Okay, so we booked to go with them. And I'd arranged to meet my sister there. So off we went, and it was very interesting, but I didn't like the feeling there. Once I could hear the, the accent, the way they were talking, it brought it, it, brought it all back. All the to memories. Me. And it, the hat, it, it brought it all back. So I wasn't all that happy there. I said, my, my, my sister turned out very nice. They've done very well there, so I was happy to see that. But I must tell I could remember everything. I can remember every single street. The we, house that you grew up? Did you go visit the yeah, house? This, this was no went to bed in just before we came to Israel, uh, 95 or something like that, in the last century. <laughs> uh, and um, we were driving in a taxi, no, my sister's car, I said, look, I've got a map of Vienna here, which they gave us on the plane. I know we lived some around here, if we were driving, if you go here and you turn right, it's the, where we, we used to live in the winter castle, but I can't see the map. And she said, no, you don't. You're quite right, but I've changed the name to the Hustler Gosley. And which district? I knew that was, that was in the uh, 20th district. And, uh, and I, but I knew exactly where, where it was. I said, it turned down the council desk, but they've changed the name, that's why I couldn't see it. And it brought back memories, but uh, it's very, very unfortunate. Uh, yes. 
It's a little thing that I hope I don't know about Corona. I don't like Corona either. <laughs> but, uh, and Jacques, how do you feel that all the synagogues in the Crystal Nacht, except for the main shul, the main synagogue, because there was in the courtyard. Yeah, you know, we we really had a very big shul, the Leopoldstraße uh, shul. I think that was the name of the shul. It's, it's like the court, and it's uh, quite a big shul. But they were they were destroyed. That was destroyed. That was destroyed. They were all burnt. The one shul that remained, because if they would have destroyed that shul, they would have destroyed yeah. all the buildings surrounding it. So the, that well, the shul is still there. No? It's still there. I've been to it. The, the, the but how do you feel? It, it has a list of names. It's got my grandmother's name is on it. My, my sister's name. My some of my cousins who passed my age. I had uh, three cousins my age. We were very very close. Got a photograph of the student just before we left, and one of them, Charlie, whose, bro whose brothers had already come on Ali Yacht. I don't know how come, I don't understand how he didn't come, because also his parents had come as well. He stayed with his grandmother, so I don't understand. And um, he apparently was arrested. I think he was taken to a camp way out of Vienna. He escaped. He was, must have been 13 at the time, he escaped, walked back to Vienna to my grandmother, um, got caught again, went to um, Theresienstadt, there was rather sort of a bad camp, but I think he actually did, died there, I don't know how. You can get that, you can get his sister from his brother in the Yad Vashem, that's all there. That was the, the other one, Incidentally, when during 1938-39, my mother volunteered to work in the Jewish soup kitchen with my two aunts. I think it was the big demand at the time, the huge one. They had about ten people working there. I've got photographs of that. So my and my mother were the group there, and while we were still there, they were working there. This uh, this aunt of mine, they had five seven children. Two, two had already gone to Israel and they were going to, and they were at permits to come to Israel. In those days it was British Palestine. Yeah. yeah, and they were going, you had to go to Romania and get a ship to Turkey. The ship went from there to Turkey and they were booked to go on that. They didn't turn up. I didn't turn up in Turkey. We, we tried to get in touch with them from there. No, they're not on. I don't know what had happened. Somebody said they probably sold the passports and, and, so that, and that was the end of them. I mean, they were they were chipped off, I think, the fish up in Auschwitz, from what I gather. I read, I read something about that ship the other day, the well known ship, and um, that was them. And. Uh, one of their daughters, she actually finished up in Israel. I don't know how. And I, I still have a, a postcard from her from um, Ganshmul. She was at the, the Ganshmul just up the road here, not far away from she, but She was being 14 there. And, uh, uh, and the other two of my uncles settled around Haifa. And uh, my cousins and they went, they still live in, so well, uh, the children still live in, uh, uh, what's the name? Cared. Named after the, came after, named after the Czechoslovakian uh, president. Masaryk. Masaryk, far Masaryk. Yeah, that's it. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and that's it. And the family that, that gave the work permits or helped your, your parents obtain these work permits in England? My parents? Yeah. Was your, was your family close? Was, were your parents close? Oh yeah, we were a very close family. My mother had six, five sisters and a brother. In fact, this one, there's only one brother. And they were very close, very close family. Then they were spread out two women in Israel. There's some in America. My father and sister went to China. Who, they were the ones who sent us our work permit from China. 
and from there they went to Australia. A lot of the Jewish people went to China and then went to Australia. Um, <coughs> we were actually in Australia one day and funny enough they had an exhibition which uh, from the Jews of from China, the refugees. In Shanghai, there, yeah. were, there was a very big German and Austrian, especially Austrian um, community in Shanghai. Yes. There was a big, a, a very big Jewish community yes. in Shanghai. And the people manning this exhibition were the people who had been in China. Wow. So, uh, and can I ask you, Jacques, um, when your father was on the island, um, when he was taken away. And he was Isle of Man here. Isle of Man. That was a terrible day for me. Did, did Rabbi Schoenfeld have any, uh, did your father have any dealings with Rabbi Schoenfeld? With, with Rabbi Schoenfeld? Rabbi Sh Solomon Schoenfeld. Did you remember the name or did you, did your father have any dealings with Rabbi Schoenfeld? Because yeah, he helped yeah. a lot of the, bring food to the uh, Isle of Man and yeah. He did a lot of tremendous good work in, in helping the, yeah. the interns. No, no, I didn't. No, no, not for, I haven't tried to visit. Uh -huh. and he, he had his two brothers went to, he just threw them there, to get them out of man. The two that had gone to hiding with the, on the Crystal Nacht. I don't know how they came to England in the first place. And him and they were all seen the out of man together. My life in the hostel was very nice. Yes, a nice group of people there. Um, Leeds were a very good community with regards to helping refugees. They, they did a lot of to get them per, work permits. That's the place, and Leeds is a place, I don't know if you know about Leeds, that's where Burton the Cane, the tailors were huge tailors. In fact, the Burton family still live there. You got to know them. And my auntie went in, well, my, my mother's sister went into um, uh, domestic service in, in the south of England. Now this is very interesting because she did the uh, English when she came. She finished up not much later. Um, the crosswords, making crosswords for the for one of the paper, English papers, daily papers. And I was just, how did it come to do that? <laughs> compiling, compiling just with the, the papers. And so that's came about doing that. And just how does it feel, you know, know, how does it feel knowing that you were literally on the last train out of Vienna? Yeah. It, it, it must be it, the most amazing... It, we, we had no idea it was going to be the last gosh. train, I mean. If that turned out to be the last train. I don't know if, I don't know what could have done if, you know, because if my sister was supposed to follow up eight days later, seven, eight days later, and then the next day, because they only just got the, the visa, and they gone straight away. And any of your friends that you had in Vienna growing up with? I can't remember. You don't, and you don't know what happened to them? I can't remember. I remember all my cousins, quite a lot of cousins, and I was, I was spoiled rotten because I was the youngest of them. But I can I can remember them. So we didn't really have any other friends beside me. We, we didn't live far away from me. I did have some friends actually, because I remember the woman was called Ben, and he and he he was on that photograph from the youth club with, with me. I can remember him. And I see that's about the only one I can remember. I was too 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 young for me to have understand what close friends are, a group of friends. At the age of seven, you don't have them. Then at 14, 15, you got your friends, but not at the age of seven. And how, how do you feel now, knowing that the Chancellor of Austria, Sebastian uh, Kurz, that he's very, very pro-Israel? Pro Austria today is one of the most pro-Israel European countries, together with the Czech Republic. Yeah, well, I mean, I wasn't happy that... It, I wasn't happy as I said the first day uh, we went on a day trip to Vienna because uh, it brought back all the, the accents and the, they brought it as, 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 and I, I speak actually still speak German fluently so when we came out to the airport uh, I paid something and the lady was giving me some change 
And I said to them in, in German, and she said, oh, Entschuldigung, ich habe hab nicht gewusst, dass du Deutsch bist. Und she said, I mean, excuse me, I didn't know you were from here. And I spoke so fluently. And my daughter was amazed. And, and, but uh, yes, it, some of the people said, you know, after the war, when you come, you should, I'd visit a set hotel, or in, as people came from the continent from here. And she said, you always used to wonder, what the hell were you doing during the war? Couldn't help it. I once in, as I stayed in, went to Glasgow, Scotland, I remember, and uh, we we stayed at a hotel by the Jewish boarding house next door where we did all our eating, and uh, except for our um, keepers in the morning, <laughs> and uh, a couple there from Vienna, and I kept saying, them, "What the hell is it?" You know, what do you think, what were they doing during the war? What? And you couldn't help him. You can listen. Did you ever go back after that day trip? Did you go, did you return to Vienna after that day trip? After? Did you ever go back again? Did you visit Vienna after that? Yeah, I've, well, I've been, after that, just before, a few years ago. I was only living here, uh, five years, six years ago, perhaps. I took just my children, and uh, we, we saw most, most of the Jewish places, obviously, with the Jewish museums, the show, I was in, there was a group of Jewish people, so I was amazed. I couldn't believe it, how many Hasidim live in Vienna now. The place is swarming with them. I couldn't believe it. You know, the streets, there's a shop right opposite the hotel called the, um, like a dim, a clothes shop, you know, another shop called Poem, selling old fancy dresses. And there's quite a few kosher restaurants there now. It's a very beautiful city. I mean, we went down to all the places where we lived, and uh, I, did not, I didn't knock on any doors to say I used to live here, I wouldn't do that. And I don't know what I would have done if I was Dr. Simmonstone, I used to live here. And you saw the brass, uh, the the brass names that they put on the on the pavement. Oh, yeah. No, I don't. Today, can't. today they mean. I didn't know. That. No, not at that time. Today, in, in most but places, my family's names up on the shawl. In the shawl, there they've got a list of people from Vienna who are there. Very nice shawl, lovely shawl. And it's also by the Jewish Museum, the Ozerua. The Ozerua. Yeah. There's a set of the. And they've got a very big uh, monument with the big yes, in, in, the, in the basically in the city centre. And, and on, on the Friday night, they had a communal dinner, must have been about 150 there, just near, near the shul, the kosher restaurant there. And have you ever been to Vienna? Yeah. And, uh, and my highlight was when they came up to me and they said, Would you make Kiddish? <laughs> Now, as you can gather, I haven't plucked a particularly good voice. <laughs> anyway, after the kitchen lady came to me, were you ever a cousin? <laughs> I tell you, I can. <laughs> that, was, that was the highlight of my trip. <laughs> so, uh, it's, a, it's very interesting. We went to all the places I remembered, to where, where we used to live. In fact, we were to show them where the hospital was, where I was born. And um, it, okay. it, had, it had a very good Jewish community before the war. I mean, my father knew all about it. The very strong Hakoa football team, which was one of the best in the country. And they had a, a team who should have been the Olympic swimmers. They, they didn't allow them to go in. Um, in fact, there was a, I saw a film recently where somebody brought this, this team, they made it here, they brought this, this team of five swimmers together, who are now in the 80s and 90s, who were the, the swimmers who were going to be in the Olympics at the time. And they made a film about them, about the, the sports club, <laughs> which has now been rebuilt upon the, the very fine sports, sports centre there. And the school where went to, it's all in the same precinct there. there. And that's it. And how do you feel 
that Austria is so pro-Israel today. It's one of the one of the few countries in Europe that is very very pro-Israel. But not until recently. But now it is. Now mm. Austria is extremely pro-Israel with yeah. this with the, the, the Chancellor, very, very pro-Israel, and the, the President of the Parliament is also yeah. extremely pro-Israel, well, pro-Jewish. Well, in Vienna, we didn't encounter any anti-Semitism, I don't think. The anti-Semitism is in all the small places in the country. Oh, but we well, still have the, the plays at Christmas, in the, which were anti-Semitic, we still have them. And that's where I see most of the anti-Semitism in Vienna itself. I mean, that's, I couldn't understand the, all these Hasidim being there. Uh, you know, uh, I didn't feel out of place. <laughs> I'm not a Gothic, but I didn't feel out of place there. And the Jewish club and um, it's, it's, as a matter of fact, when we had a dinner, the two young boys were about 15 sitting near us talking every day, so that's a matter of, oh look, speak to them every day, you know, it's, it's Israelis. Turned out, they spoke every day fluently, they learned it, they're not from, they're locals, two local boys have learned it, which was amazed me. They spoke it up quite fluently. There's a very, very strong mm -hmm. Jewish community there, very strong, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and Jacques, can I ask, why, what message can you give to your grandchildren and to the future generations? Because you had the, the great Mazal, the great um, yeah. Hashem put you on the last train to leave Vienna and you survived. But what... It all happened in, in 1914, 1916. That's where it all, I always put it down to that. I feel all this will be shared. Everything's been shared. Be shared is, it's meant to be. It, it's, it's like preordained. Yeah. But what message do you give to the, the next generation? What message can you give? What? To your children and grandchildren, what message do you give? Well, one of my grandsons here, when he was a little boy, but when we told him this story, he was about seven or eight, and, but Saba, where was your gun? I said, for example, got my, some he said, my dad's got a gun underneath his bed. <laughs> he was an officer in the army, his dad. So, I don't know. We tried to give them, I'm very pleased to say that I'm very proud of my three, my own three children. One still in England, one lives in Kibbutz, Bethlehem Mon. And one lives in Alamim. It's on the border of Gaza. It's, it is on the border, not near Gaza, but it border. And you can overlook Gaza City. And they've all got families. They've all married very nicely. And we're quite proud of them. Um, one's got two officers in the army. Pretty old colonels, a major, I think major. And, um, they, 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 know what, they know what it's about. Not all the Israeli children know about the Holocaust. And we were surprised about it. Sometimes when we, we met some children somewhere, they started talking maybe on holiday or somewhere, and they, they knew very little about it. It's, um, they were surprised. And my son is a teacher, and he's been to Poland about 10 times. I was with, his, with the, the class, his classes, where they go on every son. And, uh, yes, yeah, they're, they're very happy here. What more can I tell them? They just remember who you are and where you came from. And that's, uh, you know, that's an old story, there's a big story about that. Uh, they used to, in England, they used to turn the signposts around in case of the invasion from the Nazis, and it would confuse them. So the somebody said, how would you know, how would you know if you wanted to come to one of these sides but, and you lost your way, how would you know which way to go? So the answer is, if you know where you came from, and that's a big lesson in life, 
If you know where you came from, it will help you to the to way you go. It's a beautiful and it's, message. It's true. <laughs> wow. That's how I telling them. You remember who you are and who you, who you were. So I just want to thank you. Um, Come on then. So Jacques, it's been such an honor and a privilege to, uh, it's been a real honor and a privilege to, to reconnect and to hear your story and, um, and really to think that you were on the last train to leave Vienna. It's mm. something unbelievable. And mm. thank God you were. Because thank, thank God you, thank you God, survived. Thank and, God uh, my father been an officer and they let me go. As well. Sure. And he didn't decide to do me. It's all when I I can remember the very, I must tell you, I remember that conversation very clearly. Absolutely. I'm also an officer in the army. As a one officer, another officer, I wish you the best of luck. Didn't shake hands, Heil Hitler. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much. It's yeah, already okay. been, it's been incredible hearing your 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 life story and uh, just wish you mazel brocha uh, and maybe stream in good health till 120 and to just have nachas from your your grandchildren great grandchildren and you great picked, grandchildren you picked a good day because this morning we had our 19th great grandchild wow. last night during last night mazel tov what a way to say the mazel tov yeah so and you know the best revenge for what happened is what you've just told me. This mm. is the best revenge. Mm. So I'm Israel Chai, and I think that your beautiful that's message, that's if you know where you came from, you will know where you're going to. That's that. And that's a big lesson to remember. So thank yeah. you very, very much. You're welcome. It's been such a real honor and a privilege to, to be with you today. And I really, really am extremely grateful. Mm. Goise... Yeah. Uh, <laughs>